we need to remind ourselves, sadly to say, that we are not about to celebrate some ancient winter festival, but a birthday, which is something very personal. Birthdays are important, not just for children, because of the prospect of a party and some gifts, but for us adults as well. It means we are not forgotten or just taken for granted. We matter. The worst feeling in the world is to be overlooked or to be left out of things. In short, to feel unloved. We crave love from the moment of our birth because we need love to grow as healthy, well-balanced human beings and to be happy with ourselves, flaws and all, and with others. In one of his sermons, St Augustine asked, what is this happiness that we continually are searching for, but that proves to be so elusive, and he suggests his own view. To be happy is to know and to be known, to love and to be loved. That is what Christmas has to offer us, to know Jesus Christ and to be known by Jesus Christ, to love Jesus Christ and to be loved by Jesus Christ. In fact, Augustine would say, that is more than happiness, that is bliss, eternal life, our ultimate goal. And as Augustine would recognise, will never be fully realised in this life, but only in heaven. Our hearts, he says, are restless till they rest in God. But that raises the question, does that mean that I have to be dead and hopefully in heaven before I have a real chance of happiness? The answer to that is a firm no, you don't. And that's what Advent and Christmas are all about. When we celebrate the birthday of the Lord, we are celebrating incarnation, God becoming one of us and still being with us, very much alive and kicking, if we can put it like that without being disrespectful. The Lord Jesus is not dead, buried and gone. No, he is dead, buried, yes, but risen. And he is at hand, as we saw last week. Rejoice, he is at hand, always and everywhere. That's why today's Gospel for the fourth Sunday of Advent repeats the invitation to rejoice that we heard last Sunday. This time it is addressed to Mary personally, but others will rejoice with her uh, and because of her until the end of time. Why? <clears throat> because the presence of the child she carries brings something of heaven into human history. And already people can have a taste, an appetite, an appetizer, if you like, of the bliss that lies ahead. <clears throat> Excuse me. In chapter 11 of Luke's Gospel, a woman in the crowd one day shouted out to Jesus, Happy the womb that bore you and the breasts you sucked. And Jesus replied, Still happier those who hear the word of God and keep it. <clears throat> the Catholic tradition has always realised that Mary is not just one more individual, though an important one, in the unfolding drama of God's purpose in history, for history. Mary serves more than that. She serves as a type, a symbol of the Church herself and of what the Church exists to do and to provide, as she did, a real human, though now spiritual, body of faithful people, a body which will allow the risen Lord to go on making his presence and his power felt in our world. That's why Luke tells the story of the visitation, when Mary, carrying the child in her womb, goes to be with her cousin Elizabeth, who was also carrying a child, John the Baptist. And Luke tells us that as Mary approached, bearing Jesus, the child in Elizabeth's womb, leapt for joy. That is a powerful image. Mary representing the church, taking the initiative, going out to the world to bless Elizabeth, a world that needs to be blessed in all its own joys and sorrows with the good news that the Lord is at hand. Advent and Christmas together are a much needed reminder to us that the 
presence, the nearness of Christ can give a whole new significance to the ordinariness of life. Life becomes sacramental. And we are living in a sacramental world, a redeemed world, a world, as the poet Gerald Manley Hopkins puts it, a world charged with the grandeur of God. All we need to do is what the Jesuit philosophy of life suggests, is find God in all things. And of course, God wants to find us and to bless us in all the ordinary experiences of our lives. He wants to make our journey through life a pilgrimage of grace. Through the sacraments, we are offered a new dignity and a new destiny in our humanity. We are restored in mind and body and soul when we falter or fail. We are strengthened to face the challenges of living faithfully and serving selflessly. We are set free from every oppressive or obsessive influence that would lead us astray or threaten to stunt our growth in grace. Throughout my years as a parish priest, I looked to the fourth Sunday of Advent as the most appropriate time for our young people to celebrate the Sacrament of Reconciliation to make their first communion uh, on this Sunday, along with the whole parish. It meant that everybody's attention was focused on the Lord coming to love them and to create in them for the first time on the part of the children and once more on the part of the adults, a Christmas heart. It was the German theologian Karl Rahner who introduced me to the notion of a Christmas heart. And in a reflection on how to celebrate Christmas, he said this, have the courage to be alone. Only once you have really managed to do this and have achieved it in a Christian way, can you hope to give the present of a heart filled with the Christmas spirit. In other words, a gentle, patient, courageously collected, softly tender heart to those whom you are striving to love. This is the present, he says, which indeed you should place under the Christmas tree. Otherwise, all other presents are simply futile expense. During this whole time of Advent, we have been invited to be still, even for a short time, to thank God for the blessings that come to us through our faith and to ask him to draw near and to create in us a Christmas heart. On this fourth and final Sunday, we see and hear that Christmas heart in the person of Mary and her response to the Lord. Let what you have said be done to me. One of the features firmly embedded in any celebration of Christmas is the singing of carols, traditional and modern. You will no doubt have your own favourite. For me it's probably O Holy Night and every year in the parish I would get someone from among the parishioners to sing that carol as the procession entered a darkened church lit only by candles and the child Jesus was being carried around the church to his place in the crib. Sentimental? Yes, of course. But what's wrong with a little sentiment? But the Gospel today makes me recall another carol. In the bleak midwinter, the words were by the English poet Christina Rossetti and the music by Gustav Holst. And in verse 3 we sing, Angels and dark angels may have gathered there, cherubim and seraphim thronged the air, but only his mother in her maiden bliss worshipped the beloved with a kiss. God was welcomed into this world just as each one of us hopefully was with a kiss from our mother. Thank God for mothers. It's no wonder that the most consistently reproduced um, subject in the history of art is that of mother and child. And the image of mother and child bridges the gap between the secular and the sacred. 
People of every faith and none can identify with it. It is a universal icon of the unbreakable bond of love that exists between mother and child. A mother's love. Even the Old Testament occasionally aban abandons its normal imagery and language for God, which reflects the prevailing masculine and patriarchal culture of those times and turns to maternal imagery and language. It's a reminder to us that God is neither male nor female. Those are human constructs to allow us to speak about God. And so we have those beautiful words of the prophet Isaiah in chapter 66, where God himself says, Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will never forget. As a mother comforts her child, so will I comfort you. You know, I think the Irish got it spot on with that old traditional uh, folk song, part of Bing Crosby's repertoire, I recall. A mother's love's a blessing. Nostalgic, yes, but Christmas is the perfect occasion for a bit of nostalgia. For this final Sunday of Advent, the Church has turned to Luke's Gospel and his account of the birth of Jesus, because, as we mentioned earlier, Mark begins his Gospel with the story of Jesus' baptism, not his birth. Luke is writing about 25 or so years after Mark, and his concerns were quite different from Mark's. Luke's Gospel is often called the Social Gospel, because Luke was acutely aware that the Roman system and way of life left many people marginalised, feeling that they were nobodies, misfits, belonging nowhere, with no official provision for their basic needs as human beings. You might be tempted to say, so what's new when you look at the way our world has turned out? Luke's answer was, there is something new, and it is to be found in the network of small communities of faith in Jesus, which had slowly been building up over the Middle East. For Luke, it was vital that the spirit of Jesus prevail in any community that claimed to be Christian. More than that, life's outcasts and misfits should be able to sense the presence of Jesus himself precisely among his disciples. And of course, that's why Luke set out in his gospel a picture of Jesus in action, always concerned for those on the edges, stopping to engage with them, women, lepers, the poor, the hurt and broken of humanity. Jesus, in Luke's Gospel, was and is the Good Samaritan. So the challenge to the communities, make sure that Jesus is incarnate among you. Don't just speak about him, give him flesh and blood, give him a tangible body, your own. So it shouldn't come as any surprise to us that Luke would want to bring Mary and her role into the picture. Who more qualified to show us the challenge of agreeing to the Incarnation, the personal challenge? The renowned German Protestant theologian Karl Barth confessed to some Catholic friends once that he often listened to the Catholic morning uh, sermons on the radio and he remarked that he had never once heard a sermon on Mary. So you see, he said mischievously, you can get on without her after all. Well, whatever the reason for the lack of sermons, one thing is sure, we cannot do without Mary, nor would we want to. From the moment Jesus looked down on her from the cross and said to her, Behold your son, and entrusted the beloved disciple standing there beside her to her love and protection, Mary has been with the Pilgrim Church on its earthly journey, in their minds and hearts and affections, a source of inspiration and reason for joy. I sometimes think that perhaps we are tempted to make uh, 
a mistake when we speak of Mary. We do her a disservice. We put her on a pedestal. Uh, we slightly dehumanise her, understandably trying to keep her at a safe distance from life's messiness. But we know from personal experience that mothers are stronger than we sometimes give them credit for, and Mary was no exception. She was warned by Simeon in the temple that Jesus would challenge people and a sword would pierce our own soul. It did as she stood there at Calvary. Mary is familiar with the pain and suffering that every human being has to cope with uh, throughout life. Over the centuries, many people have found that she has a ready ear and a warm heart. She can help us to trust ourselves to her son and to the love that he has for us. Let me leave you with a story. It's the real life story of someone who came to be thankful when she discovered the real Mary at a low point in her life and came to experience deep healing grace. Several years ago, I was invited to conduct a retreat for the young students preparing for priesthood uh, in the English uh, college in Valladolid in Spain. There was a young woman visiting the college at the same time. She wasn't on the retreat. And over the week, we bumped into each other and we talked and she told me her story and why she returns every now and again to the college with the support of the rector. She had been the victim of a brutal rape earlier in her life, which had left her in a dark despair and desolation. She was Catholic, but found it hard, well nigh impossible, to share what she was going through with anyone not even in prayer. She felt that no one would really understand, and certainly not Mary. Mary immaculate, untouched by sin, pure in heart. They had nothing in common, she felt. But she'd been told by a friend of a famous statue of Mary that in fact is to be found in the English college uh, in the chapel in Valladolid. It's called the Vulnerata, which is the Latin for the wounded one. It was ancient, it was made of wood and had stood in a church in the southwest of Spain, in Cadiz. In 1596, an English fleet had attacked the Spanish fleet in the port of Cadiz. You may have heard of the incident in history class. It was referred to as Drake singeing the beard of the King of Spain. Well, the English troops sacked the city and went on a rampage of destruction, rape and pillage. Some soldiers dragged a statue of the mother and child from a church that they came across and they publicly desecrated it, hacking at it with their swords. They cut off the mother's arms and a fair bit of the child. The statue was left, as it were, untouched, wounded, when the local people salvaged it and they presented it to the Queen of Spain. And she, in turn, presented it to the English College because they wanted to make reparation for the assault. And the statue stands to this day exactly untouched, wounded, above the altar in the College Chapel. On her first visit to the College, this young woman had found herself in the chapel and immediately drawn to the vulnerata. This represented Mary as someone she could relate to, someone who would understand. It was the beginning of her recovery, her way back to sanity, and she comes now and again to say thank you. A mother's love is indeed a blessing. May Mary, Mother of God and our Mother, bless you and yours this Christmas with the love of her beloved Son, whom she first brought to us at the first Christmas. Goodbye. God bless.